Listen only mode. Good morning for those in Europe. Good afternoon for those in China. This is Ludmila Hikova from EUSME Center in Beijing. You have just joined the EUSME Center webinar on how to access the fourth largest food market in the world. Before we move into the seminar, just let me check quickly if the audio is working properly. In the webinar panel on your screen, there should be a function that says raise your hand. So please, if you can now raise your hand, those who can hear me properly. Okay, I see uh, raised hands, so I assume that you can hear us well. Then uh, we have uh, quite a lot of participants. We have about 70 participants. So uh, please be assured that you are on a mute mode. So don't worry if your mics are uh, open or not. You, have my, you may uh, notice also in your panel that there are other functions available for you. Amongst them, there is a particle one for questions. Use it to send uh, us any questions you may wish to ask to us. We will uh, answer it during our Q&A section, which will follow after the, uh, at the end of the webinar. If we do not manage to address your questions directly during the webinar, we will get back to you uh, via email. However, you may always put your questions through our website usmecenter.org.cn where we have a particle space for Ask the Expert. I believe that many of you have heard already about EUSME Center. However, uh, for those who are for the first time joining us, let me introduce shortly the purpose uh, of our center in Beijing. So basically the EUSME Center is a project funded by the European Union and uh, its main aim is to help, is to assist uh, European small and medium sized enterprises to invest and export to China. We do it uh, through Via, via several tools. One of them is we reply to the inquiries. For example, is there a market for your product or what are the labor costs and taxes? And other services, another way how we are helping uh, EU SMEs is via publications. We have over 70 uh, reports, guidelines and case studies which will help you to understand how to do business in China. We as well provide trainings, seminars and webinars as this one today, how to export the food to China. For that we have asked our internal expert, Mr. John Echanove. Uh, John, welcome. Welcome. Please. Good morning, good afternoon, depending where you are. <laughs> Please, would you be so kind and tell us a few words about yourself to introduce your expertise? Yes, um, thank, thank you very much, Lumila. Um, it's been already quite a number of times that I've been here, so I'm not going to extend too long on, 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 on my profile or my qualifications, but just basically I've been involved in standardization and market access for already more than 13 years uh, before within the European standards or sorry, European Committee for Electrotechnic Standardization, later on a second southern for different projects and organizations, and with a strong focus on China, of course, because of the importance for the, um, for the European uh, industry. Um, what we try to do today 
is to give um, the audience uh, those more than 70 people that have uh, so dreadfully joined our webinar to, to give the main elements that they should be aware of when exporting food into China. Um, the food sector, as any other sector uh, around the world, is, is probably one of the most complex. Um, and what we try to do today is just make sure that when you participants leave this webinar, uh, know more or less what would be the steps that should, you should be looking at and, and where you can find some resources to help you uh, move further. Hmm? Okay, John, uh, before we move directly to the topic, uh, we have prepared a poll for, the, for our participants. Yeah. And uh, we would like to ask a question to you. And the question is, which administration you believe is the most relevant for SME when exporting food to China? We have four options. One is Ministry of Commerce, one is Ministry of Health, or General Administration of Quality, Supervision, Inspection and Quarantine. And last option, State Food and Drug Administration. So we can see you are voting now. We will give you a few more seconds to finish your choice. Yeah. Okay, so let me close now because I think that most of you have expressed your views already. John, would you wish to uh, comment about results? Um, yes. Um, um, actually, uh, I can see that 40% of them they believe that IQ security is the most relevant uh, for export of food, and, 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 and that is the case. Uh, we will go in the next slides to clarify what makes that particular body important if uh, you're particularly dealing with, with export. You, you will probably here, when, you, when you're dealing with China, name of different administrations that will at some point uh, have some responsibility related to food. And one of them is AQSIQ, who you necessarily have to be familiar with. You will have also probably uh, heard about MOFCOM, and MOFCOM will probably uh, come into place when you're dealing with import licenses. Uh, you would probably heard of uh, Ministry of Agriculture if you are selling feed or seeds into China. Um, Ministry of Health, when there are elements related to diseases or the spread of particular elements. Um, you will have um, SAIC, uh, who is actually in charge of protecting citizens and businesses, um, also in food related issues. And finally, SFDA, who is the one responsible for certain elements of licenses and, um, and supervising at the time of consumption, directly in restaurants, schools, or whatever it is. Now, most of you said AQSAQ is the most important one, and if you're dealing with exporting, and, 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 and that's what we're trying to talk today about, yes, it is the most important one. AQSAQ as an organization, first of all, is in charge of the uh, safety law. Uh, the, all, the law itself, all the regulations that are uh, hanging behind the law are uh, mandated uh, to AQSAQ. Also, SAQ, AQSAQ is the one that we negotiate protocols for a particular set of products that we're going to, to look at it later. And, they are, is, and it is the organization in charge of keeping the database of uh, exporters that can be registered. Hmm? Um, now, it is not only that AQSAQ is important for those elements, it's also because under AQSAQ there are different organizations um, that give support to AQSAQ or that depend on AQ, AQSAQ that will have something to say when you export food 
into China. Um, the first one on the uh, on the upper right corner, CIQ, which is at the entry port, is going to be in charge of, do the, of doing the commodity inspection of your product, and is going to be the organization that approves your labeling of your food product. So you will definitely have to deal with them. You will certainly have to have some contact with, a, with SAC, either direct or indirect, because SAC, which is the Standards Administration of China, is the one that has and owns the technical standards where you will see the technical requirements for your products or labeling, mandatory labeling elements, etc., etc. And finally, you have CNCA, which is on the lower left corner, um, because in the case that you have to sign some protocols, CNCA will be the responsible for the approval of establishment, for inspecting the establishment, establishment that can export into China. Um, I've just added CCC mark so that you will have an idea. It has nothing to do with food. CCC mark is not related to food, but that is the same organization. That organization that inspects and takes and is responsible for the CCC is also the same organization that inspects establishments to export food into China. Um, now, how easy it is to export food into China? Well, that would be probably the same as um, um, the same as um, as many other countries. Now we would be we will we will be talking about different levels of of dangerous uh, products. So um, if we're talking about live animals or plants or frozen food, those will be considered quite dangerous. Uh, because they are less processed food. Now, at the very end of it, the least dangerous products are those that are processed food or prepackaged food. What you will have to do, depending on those products, varies substantially. One of, one of the main elements that will happen with very dangerous products is that they will have to have and a, a bilateral agreement between different administrations. So your uh, national administration, non-European national administration, will have to have an agreement with AQSAQ um, on whether your national system is good enough to guarantee the safety of those products, um, and also uh, negotiate and or negotiate a health certificate that will have to be shown in customs. There might be, depending on the product and approval of establishment, that I said before, carried out by CNCA. And you may have other ministries involved, as in the case of, of animal feed, where the Ministry of Agriculture will have to provide a license. That is the most complex part. What is the easiest part? Well, the easiest part is prepackaged food, where you basically will have to comply with three requirements. I will go through them. There are two in the screen, which are the technical requirements what exactly your product has to be, um, and labeling requirements, what you have to label your product. The third one is that you will have to register as an exporter, and we will go to that later on. Now, one of the things that you should be aware of when you, when you export into China, in particular if you're talking about dangerous products, is to identify if your country has already or does not a bilateral agreement or bilateral protocol signed with China. What we are giving you in this screen is the link to those already approved countries and products and establishment if that's the case where you can look if your country can or not do it. Now this is a snapshot in any case. Um, this is a date of the last announcement of AQSAQ, there are regular updates. Hmm? John, uh, sorry, sorry for interrupting. No, uh, no. I have a question. What will happen if there isn't uh, any protocol, or uh, how long would it take to have one? Um, well, that's, that's, that's a valid question, and, and actually we, we received quite a number of inquiries from the SME Center about that. Um, 
that is a quite long process. Uh, worst, ca worst case scenario, we might be talking about seven years. Uh, uh, two or three years to negotiate the, um, the agreement with QSAQ on the protocol. If you need a health certificate, you may add another two years and then you have the approval of the establishment another two years. It can be less than that. You can do it in two years, but in any case, it's not something that happens very straightforward. Um, that is a work that is normally done by the national authorities, and those are the ones that have to put pressure on AQSAQ in order to have the protocol signed. And of course, the smaller countries have less of a saying in putting pressure on AQSAQ. Now, we've talked with AQSAQ trying to identify what would make a process go faster. And what would make a process go faster if AQSAQ also receives from the Chinese side, from the importer side, saying we want to buy, for example, a beef from Belgium. Now, if you have already a lot of importers asking AQSAQ when are you going to have that sign, then AQSAQ will take that as a priority and try to move it faster. Um, just one clarification before I move on in this slide. There are products that only require a health certificate and not a protocol. And I'm putting an example here with the milk, milk products. You will see which countries are eligible, and each country has a sample of the certificate that is recognized by, um, by China. In this example, we've put UK. Um, now, what, what you will find when you go to these links well, this is what you find. On the left side, you have the Chinese bar. On the right side, we have added a Google translation. So then, just to help you um, realize that you can operate on your own, at least to identify what the legislation says. And this is the example of France. Hmm? Um, what kind of meat France is allowed to export? Hmm? That you will find directly in the link. Hmm? Um, if we're talking about a certificate, like in the milk products, what you will find in their web page is a sample of the certificate that you have to provide. Mm -hmm. um, now we talk about some. Mm, we we talk some um, of the administrations, and one of them is Mofcom. We also receive quite a number of inquiries about uh, whether you need or not import license. Now, there are products that you would require import license. Uh, meat, you would require it. Uh, alcoholic drinks, you will need it. But that is a responsibility of the importer. It is not the exporter, it is not the EU manufacturer, the one that has to have the import license. That's a requirement on the importer. Of course, if there is the need for an import license, then there is probably an increase on, of cost. But that is not something you have to take care of. You just have to be aware of it that your agent on the other, on the other end should have it. What we're giving you in the screen is, first of all, uh, the link to the new diagnostic kit developed by the USME Center where you can uh, have a look at the export goods services and technology guidelines when you will find uh, those links related to the import licenses. And also we have added the links of the latest editions of the import license, those automatic import license and those products with import license. Now this is the automatic import license when you click there and there is a link for an Excel file that will provide you with all the information. Mm -hmm. That's the Google translation of it. Mm -hmm. um, when you arrive to this page you have an Excel file when you have every single product that requires automatic import license. Still it is in Chinese, still we believe that a standard Google translation will help you go through that or if you have internal capacity, I mean, Chinese capacity, Chinese staff, they will have you quite briefly. No. Um, what is new or what is something that um, 
has happened recently. We're talking about October 2012. And is that since then, AQXAQ requests any exported of food to be registered in their database. Um, now, you have, and we'll give you some snapshots of what, what the website looks like, uh, but basically what you're going to be asked is your name, who is your agent, so who is your trade partner in China that is contactable by the Chinese authorities, addresses of both of you as a supporter and as the agent, contact names, numbers, um, and what kind of food product are you going to to export, you're willing to export. Mm -hmm. Now, that registration is not online, and the web page that we have provided you is something like this. Mm -hmm. You will have um, to log in or to click on the left side of the screen, which says the filling management system for imported food exporters or agents overseas. And when you go there, you will see that there is um, Two, two, two buttons, one for login and another, another one for the initial registration, which is the one that if you go for the first time, you have to, to click. Now, if you click there, you will have to fill in three main parts of it. The first one is the, uh, your information who you are, as an applicant with all these elements. Now, as you see, the, all the, um, all the, different fields are in English, so it's, it, it's not a big deal to, to, to fill in it. Um, you also have to identify which is the food category, and there's a third element where you do have to include who your Chinese trade partner is. Hmm? John, it, it all looks very much um, straightforward or easy, but I'm sure there must be some, some catch. What, what, what it is? Tell us. We haven't heard of, of, of of having a catch there yet. Um, it, it, it looks simple and we haven't received negative feedback from that still. Um, however, what we have been told is that, and, and that is not surprising, if you've been in China dealing with different uh, softwares of the Chinese government, that it would only work if you use Internet Explorer, so don't even try it with, with other uh, with other um, softwares, um, and it's highly recommended that when you do it, you don't have anything else open, uh, because if not, the system might collapse. But besides that, we haven't heard of anything more than that. Hmm? Um, still, it's something new, so maybe in the next month we carry on receiving feedback, but so far we haven't. Um, now, when you already have an idea of that you can export, um, that you have identified your agent, you have identified your distributor, um, there's still some of the things that you should know. And, and, and there are two elements there, the, the one the packaging and the labeling that we want to talk about. The, the first one is about packaging requirements. And experts tell us that, in general, um, European Union has stricter, at least equivalent, packaging requirements or regulation than China. So you shouldn't be massively concerned with that. Still, uh, the Chinese standard, uh, GB slash T that you have on the screen, um, although highly harmonized with international one, may have some small deviations. Now you may want to look at it. Hmm? Um, the, uh, the inspection of your packaging will happen at the same time of your community inspection when you will have it. If you want more information of the packaging requirements, uh, you can just log into our web page and download the guideline on packaging. Hmm? Um, but from our point of view, it won't constitute a huge burden to, to export. Hmm? I mean, uh, in relation to the packaging is uh, related to it is labeling as well. And uh, we have a 
second of all for you, for our audience. And uh, it's about uh, labeling. It's labeling question. So uh, we have a, we are just about to launch the poll. And you can see the, the question. And the question is, labeling requirements for prepackaged food are either voluntarily, mandatory and in Chinese, or mandatory but at least in English, or the last option, only mandatory for dangerous products. So if you can choose, what do you think is more most likely the correct answer. We will give you a few more seconds to make a choice, then we will close the poll and share the results with you. Okay, so I'm about to close the poll and share with you the results. So I can see that most of you almost 87 percent has chosen mandatory and in Chinese. John, what's, what's the correct answer? Well, that's wonderful. It is uh, the, the correct answer. It should be that way. Um, that there are all the products where you have additional voluntary labeling. Um, you may want to do some organic labeling or whatever it is. But when we're talking about uh, prepackaged food or food, you have labeling that is mandatory. Now, um, of course it's mandatory. Uh, it is important to know that it varies depending on the product. Uh, something that you should know and is that you can have your label approved before your product comes into the, China, in, into the market. The organization, as I said before, that has to approve your label is CIQ. Um, we highly, we would strongly recommend that you send your labels to be approved before you have your shipment arriving in China. If there's anything wrong with the with the labeling, it's really a hassle and it's a cost to have your products there in customs yard just paying for nothing. Um, and once the labels are approved, they are printed. That would be your agent who has uh, or the Chinese agent that has the access to CIQ, and then they will be fixed on the package of each product. Hmm. Now, what are the standards you should be aware of when we talk about uh, labeling? Well, there is a general standard, which is the first one, which gives the general elements for prepackaged food. And then you have another level of standards depending on your product. There's a mandatory standard for the nutrition label. Um, and then there are elements difference in case you're talking about alcoholic beverages or if your food has any special dietary uses. Those are the main standards you should be aware of. And those standards, um, most of them can be found in English. Hmm? Um, if, if you cannot find them, just contact us. We, I think we can provide them. Hmm? Um, and they're all mandatory standards. Now, what has to be in the label? Where, as, as you said, is, it has to be in Chinese. Uh, it is allowed to have other languages uh, as long as they are not bigger than the Chinese characters. Mm -hmm. uh, you can also use Pinyin, but again, it shouldn't be bigger in, in fonts, bigger than the Chinese characters. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, of course, it's not related to the trademark, which obviously can be bigger than the label itself. Hmm? Something to be aware of is that you may have some labeling requirements in the technical standard. Hmm? Uh, we're bringing in the example of wine. Um, the, as you see, it's telling you to comply with GV. 10344, which is the one related to um, um, to alcoholic beverages, labeling of alcoholic beverages, which also refers to the mandatory standard, general mandatory standard on, on prepackaged food. But still, there are some clauses that you have to make sure 
depending on the definitions of the standards, that you should make sure that it is in line with the standard. And that may happen not only for wine, may happen for olive oil and, and other products. Hmm? John, I'm uh, sorry, a very much like question. Uh, does it mean that all product standards have labeling requirements? Um, well, we, we, I don't know all the standards, uh, but um, um, and, and it might be that some not. My guess is that all the standards will have at least uh, some elements related to definition of the product. Mm -hmm. So if you have a, a product standard and it's existing a mandatory product standard, well, check. Uh, check two things. One is, is there any specific labeling requirements additional to the mandatory general uh, labeling standards and the second one check the conformity assessment what is the test method they're going to use mm. uh, for, for different elements if there are any mm. Mm. Um, to, to sum up uh, the, the labeling requirements um, just bear in mind that it has to be pre-approved and it can be pre-approved um, that is going to be CIQ, uh, that it may vary quite a lot in terms of cost. Mm? Uh, it depends on the product, depends on the quantity, and something that we have experienced uh, quite uh, frequently here in China is that regulations change quite often, and it's not that transparent what the changes happen. So. Um, if you have an agent, if you have an importer, just make sure that you reconfirm the libraries are okay before you carry on sending further shipments. Hmm? Now, um, besides the labelings, there are particular elements in the products that might deviate from the European standards. Um, we haven't found out huge differences in the products, either wine, olive oil, or beer, or chocolate, but there are some technical differences. Um, we are not going to give you now all the different elements that you may find in those standards, but those standards can also be found in English, and if not, you will have to find of translating them, but you have to make sure that from a technical point of view, you are complying with the product standard, with the technical requirements that are set out there. Because most certainly, your products will go through commodity inspection, and of course, you will have to declare in your labeling that those different technical elements are in line with the product standard. Hmm? Um, now, just for you to know, and this is quite quite briefly, uh, the standards that we are referring to, as you have seen in the previous slide, are mandatory standards, but they are called the Wobiao standards. Hmm? Those standards are the ones that are most uh, easy to find, and most probably uh, you will be able to find them in English, just Googling them. Hmm? Now, um, where can you find those standards? Well, um, the easiest way to find them is to go to the SAC webpage. We've given you a link to the English uh, interface, and they have a search tool where you can look to those standards. If your product is one of the standards that we have presented in this presentation, just simply Google it, and you will find different uh, bodies that have taken care of translating it. Hmm? Um, both European and not European. You may find it in English or even in your national language. Hmm? Um, again, if you don't find them and if you need them, contact us. Uh, we may be lucky to find it, uh, and at least we will try it out for you. Hmm? Um, now, some um, just an example of what we're talking about, technical requirements, and, and this comes from an inquiry that we received here in the UCN Center, when uh, someone wanted to export uh, chocolate was aware that there was a difference in the amount of copper 
allowed in the chocolate. Um, and this is just an, a snapshot or an extract of the technical requirements as presented in the Chinese standard. This is to acknowledge the only difference in chocolate between China and Europe. Still, you have to be aware when you're trying to access the Chinese market. And that will apply also for different products. You have to look whether there are substantial differences. Um, in our view, in, um, in our experience, there are definitely not huge differences of the different products. So just go for it, at least not of the products that we have presented. Um, a final element that you should be aware is food additives. And this is something that you will have to declare in your labeling. Um, in general, and based on our experience, as a European producer and exporter, you shouldn't have big difficulties to comply with the China's requirements. Normally, um, European uh, regulations are much tighter than the Chinese, and probably you are all aware of the different food safety issues that have happened recently with, in the last year with the melanin and the, with the baby formula and so on. And, and that uh, also had, had an impact on, on, on the Chinese consumers that are much more aware of, of, of those elements and, and those safety elements, which is a benefit for uh, European brands, which are regarded as safer than Chinese ones. Um, the food additives are listed in, in, in one standard as into parts, which is the uh, 2760. Um, and the only thing that you have to verify that is that you are declaring according to the nomenclature. Um, there, the standard itself provides a table that matches uh, the international way of naming them, the, the, the food additives, so it's, 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 not a huge, it's not a huge problem. Hmm? Um, and the only element that probably you have to be aware of, and again it comes to the changes, is that China legislation changes quite fast, quite quickly, and you have to be aware of the updates. Um, we have uh, developed a guidelines also in food additives to help manufacturers um, and, and European producers to understand what is needed. Um, in our view, the only thing that might be a burden for an European producer is if there is a, few, a food additive that is, is not yet uh, in the list of, of the Chinese legislation. Then that additive has to be added, and that may take quite a quite amount of resources, both in time and, 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 and money. Um, we, in the EU Semi-Center, we're trying to develop um, ways to present as simple as possible the information that you have to be uh, aware of in, in, in exporting or importing products into China. And, and we have started by wine, and, and although it's, it's still, it's, it's now under revision, but you can still go to the web page and and see this particular, what we call infographics. And uh, clicking on the different elements and in the different steps, it will uh, give you the information you need for each of the different steps, identifying the standard, uh, the uh, labeling requirements, um, what are the documentation in terms of custom clearance, and et cetera, et cetera. And, and for me, that would be the end. Um, I would love to uh, keep, or at least left in your brains, uh, some ideas. The first one is um, food products are very complex, but not different than any other market. Mm -hmm. um, if your product is considered not very dangerous, that is prepackaged food or highly processed food, then uh, it is not that difficult. You will have to bear in mind 
uh, the registration of the exporter. You will have to bear in mind if you need or your agent importer needs import license or not. You will have to take care of the labeling requirements, which also links with the technical requirements that is set out in mandatory standards. That fortunately, you most probably can find them easily. If we're talking about something different, if we're talking about uh, live animals, frozen food, um, plants, then we're probably talking about something more complex and in that case we recommend that you go to the, um, to the authorities, so to the national authorities, so that you can, um, you can look at uh, whether there is an existing protocol. You have the links that we have provided to check that. And if there is an existing protocol, how can you be part of those uh, establishments? And if you not, uh, well, put pressure on the national authorities to start contacts with AQSAQ to um, start discussing at least the protocol. Yeah. John, thank you very much for an interesting uh, presentation covering such a wide topic as the importation of the food to, to China. I would like to uh, address now the, our audience. Uh, we are receiving uh, already some uh, questions from you, but please, uh, those who haven't uh, asked yet, and uh, you would like to uh, put a question to us, please uh, do it now through the question panel. Send it to us. We will try to answer either now during our Q&A uh, session, or if we will not manage to answer your question during the webinar, we will get back to you afterwards uh, via, uh, via the email. Uh, yes, so uh, I will come now to the list of our questions. We have received really quite a lot of them. Uh, John, may I, may I start? Yeah, yeah, yes, go ahead. This, um, Eric from, from Denmark, he is asking how long, uh, how long does it take to become an approved establishment? Okay, um, well, if, if there is an existing protocol in place, I mean, if there is not, if, if there is not a protocol between two countries, then, then it will take longer. Um, if it's only the establishment, actually CNCA is probably the most efficient of the Chinese administration in terms of inspection. Um, and I, I would a safe estimate would be that can be done in, in probably a year and a half, you know, two years. Hmm? It's quite a lengthy procedure, no? It is. It is. It, 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 it is. Uh, I mean, it's only one organization for the whole yeah. world, so it takes some time. Yep. And um, now we have another question. Uh, the question relates to the registration, registration of the exporters. Uh, does it mean that the distributor is as well the importer? Well, what 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 should be there is the agent that has the right to import. Hmm? Uh, uh, sometimes distributors and importers are the same one, but in principle, is the agent that actually has the right to access customs and CIQ to bring out the, mm -hmm. the goods. Mm -hmm. Then we have another question and it's related to the, to the labeling. Uh, the, the person who asked this question is not sure about the content of the label. And the question is if the sender can uh, somehow help with uh, checking if the content of the label is, is mm -hmm. correct. Um, well, uh, no, uh, unfortunately we can't. Um, we, we can provide the, the, the standards that are related to that, um, but my suggestion for that would be that they actually check with the agent, with the important, what are the labeling requirements, and in any case, send it to CIQ to confirm that, that it's pre-approved. Mm -hmm. It should be a step before even doing the shipping. Yeah. Then, uh, then we have uh, two questions related to language, language of the standards. And, the, and uh, it is basically the, the content is the same. Is it easy or difficult or how easy or difficult is to find standards in, uh, in English? Um, how difficult it is? 
Um, well, it, it, it depends, actually. Um, the general standards, mandatory general standards in terms of labeling, food additives, safety, they are all easily uh, found in, in English. And many of the product standards are also easily found in English. Maybe wine, even olive oil. Um, but you will still find some of them that will you will not be able to do it in, in, in English. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, when I'm talking about the product standards, so general standards about labeling, safety, food additives, packaging, and so on, that most certainly you can find it in English. Not very pro not, not a big problem. Product standards, many of them you can't find them in English. Some of them, unfortunately, you can't. Mm -hmm. Thank you, John. Now we have a quite a, a few few questions, and I will I choose the first one, which is a very tasty one. It's about ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> what about ice cream product? What is what is needed when uh, I mean European company wants to import ice cream to China? Yep. Um, well, you, you will you you will need. Um, as, as we have said, you would definitely need to be registered uh, as an exporter, so therefore you will have to find an, an agent. You will have to comply with the labeling requirements and food additives. And there are two, manda there are two mandatory standards on ice cream. I, I can't recall now on the top of my head whether the name and the number of those standards, but there are technical requirements that you should comply with um, as regards uh, ice cream. So basically, the same steps that we have been describing in the webinar. Mm -hmm. okay. so, then uh, another question is uh, about the procedure and documents needed when importing uh, food to China. Question is, do you need anything more than import license, certificate, health certificate, uh, mm -hmm. to export 100% to China in bulk? Um, I guess that what they, uh, the, the question is, do you need anything more than the importation, the certificate of origin, or has certificate to, to, to reach the whole Chinese market, I, I, I guess. Um, well, there are two parts of that question for me. One is that, is that all you need is an importation uh, certificate of origin and health certificate? Well, it depends on your product. Hmm? Um, there are, as I said, there are labor requirements, technical requirements that you have to comply with, so that might not be enough. Um, um, so you have to check what are you looking for. Um, if your product is allowed, so it depends what you're doing. Can you access the whole China? Yes, you do. Uh, although distribution channels in China are not particularly easy, and, and our experience of, of SMEs is that um, Trying to reach the whole China, if it's a first experience in trying to reach China, is not a very wise decision. It's better to focus on one particular entry point uh, that you've have done some research and found that there is a market there and staying there. Also because many of your agents and distributors, they don't have a network for the whole China. They're probably specializing in part of, I mean, Beijing or maybe Shanghai or south of China, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Then uh, we have one more. We are receiving really a lot of uh, questions today. Seems that we have chosen the right topic. <laughs> and uh, I'll pick up the, the question about the frozen meat. Uh, how to manage the export of frozen meat products to, Ch to China? And there are examples like pig ears or chicken legs and yeah. so on. Okay. Um, I, I actually, we, we, we receive a lot of inquiries about meat from Europe, and, and, and we are we would probably develop a specific report on meat. Um, it, it depends on the country you come from. There are some European countries that have concluded uh, protocols with AQSAQ to export meat, and I mean, and, and, and pork is is the most or the easiest one. You will find that most of the European countries that can export meat can export um, pork, not so much uh, 
place. Now, I, I don't know where, where this question comes or who's the person, so I don't know the country, but my suggestion is to go to the link that we have provided in one of the slides, check if his or her country is there, and then, uh, and then decide if, if it's eligible. Now, if it's not there, if, you, if, if his or her country is not in that list, then he will have to go to the national authorities. This is, this is not an, 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 an immediate process. It will take some years to find an agreement. Hmm? The, uh, as I said, Chinese authorities will have to inspect uh, the national authorities of your country of origin so they are satisfied in the way you handle the risks of food. Um, they will have to have an agreement on the health certificate and, and most probably also um, an, an approval of specific establishment that can export. Hmm? Um, First thing, check with your national, well, first thing, check with the link we have provided. Is your country there? Is not your country there? If your country is there, go to your national authority and ask whether you can be included into the approved establishments. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, John. And uh, we are coming to the last question because uh, our time is uh, coming close. But let's see, we'll manage a few more, but uh, let's uh, ask. John, this one. Should it be possible to have the organic Chinese standards? Um, the, it is possible. Um, um, I'm not sure whether you will be able to find them in English though. Now, uh, what I recommend, uh, because I, I don't have the information here, but the USME Center has a guideline on voluntary labeling. And that guidelines give you the name of the organization in charge of organic labeling. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a web page where you can search in English what are the standards. In that case, it won't be national standards. It will be professional standards um, that applies to the different products. But not the standard itself. Mm -hmm. It will be the reference of the standard. And, and, and for what I can remember, it will be in Chinese standards, not in English. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, I would like to stress that the uh, whole uh, webinar presentation will be available on our uh, website later on, and we will send it to your emails after this webinar is finished as well. So you don't need to worry that you, in case you missed some information, that uh, you will not find the answer. Uh, yeah, we have a, we have a. We have a time for last question, and the question is about labeling standards again, and uh, snacks. What are the labeling standards for snacks, John? Um, well, there is definitely one standard that is the general standard for prepackaged food that we have presented um, in, in, in the slides. Um, but, and, and that, in principle, should be should be all, and then you have to take care of the input. It depends also what the snack is, what, what exactly, what, what we're talking about. We're talking about dry meat, then they're probably more complex than if, if we're talking about candies. Um, but in principle, pre-packaged food, first standard, go to the general standard mandatory requirements for uh, labeling. That is the standard that rules uh, all the pre-packaged food. Only if your food has something different, something special, then you will have to add elements of it. Only if your food has a specific product standard, for example, the wine, then you will have to be looking at different labeling requirements. But you always start by the general standard of labeling requirements. And also don't forget that it's mandatory, the nutritional value of the food. And so it's something that you also have to, to add to that. Uh, thank you, John, again. Uh, I just would like to remind that uh, on our website, eusmecentre.org.cn, we have a lot of uh, information, publications, case studies uh, related to uh, import uh, of all the food and the beverage. So please check our websites. If you have any uh, problems uh, with the downloading, contact us. Uh, we, will, we will try to help. 
if you do not uh, manage, if you haven't managed to ask the questions during today's uh, webinar, uh, please uh, connect with, uh, with us via the USME Center. There is a place where you can uh, put your question directly, ask the expert, and we will get back to you uh, via, via the email. So this is where we are slowly uh, coming to the end of the webinar today. I want to thank very much to John Echanova to give us a uh, detail and wide information presentations about the importing food uh, to China. My, thank you, John. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Lumira. <laughs> and uh, I would like to thank uh, as well to all our participants for joining us uh, today. We are preparing uh, other webinars for the next uh, Tuesday. I believe that the most of you have already uh, received the invitation. We will have a webinar next week uh, around the same time. Uh, I would like to ask you as well, uh, after the webinar is finished, there is a short survey, uh, survey, so if you can express your opinion about the content of the webinar, the USME Center, and so on. It will help us to uh, provide our services on a better quality. Uh, then, um, again, thank you very much. And uh, listen, hope to, hope to, uh, we will, you will join us uh, for another webinar next week. Goodbye.